we read in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5. Let me read from verse 16 of chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, reading from verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Particularly that last sentence in verse 18, giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now I think it is that you would probably agree with me that for all of not most of us here, one of the things that has become increasingly evident as we've uh, lived the years that God has given to us is that sadly that there is a decrease in the influence uh, of Christianity and Christian teaching uh, in the various uh, places in, in society. We see it in terms of those who rule over us, we see it in terms of education, whether it be at the uh, level of infants and young adults, or whether it be at the university level. What is it? What it is that we see that is happening is that those without God, those who hate God, that they were trying very subtle and yet perhaps not so subtle ways at times to squeeze God out of the picture, to cast God aside if it were that they were able to do that. And one of the results of this, I think, that we see more and more is that the influence of the church is not as it once was, and it would seem to be at this time, certainly, that even we as God's people, that we know that the power of God is perhaps previous generations knew the power of God in their lives as individual Christians and as a part of the body of Jesus Christ. It is that we see that we live at a time when what's being promoted and what it is that men rejoice in is that which is ugly. And it is that today, increasingly, that which is celebrated in art or in music eh, or in painting or whatever it may be, very often it's that which is promoted and behind it even in terms of its ethical standards, it is that which is ugly, it's that which is debasing, it is that which is dishonouring to God. And yet the things that are good, the things that are lovely, the things that eh, are of good report, the things that would do not only individuals good but indeed society as a whole good, it is that these things are cast aside. And we see this in, in many forms and in many places and in many circumstances. I think it is that you would agree with me that our society is becoming debased, that there's a sort of Britishness that seems to be increasing eh, amongst the, 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 us here in, in the West. And I think that one of the ways in which this is made very evident is in a very simple and yet profound way. And it's in terms of what it is that we be given to us and what it is that expected from those of us to whom it is that things are given. It is that we find ourselves living at a time of entitlement, when it is that young people, young adults especially, think that everything that is out there should rightly be theirs. I don't know if it is that you've ever read from some companies that when it is that they're interviewing this millennial generation, one of the things that strikes them and horrifies them is that when we perhaps in our day would go for an interview, it is that we would uh, humble ourselves, it is that we would give honour to the fact that even we were being allowed to be interviewed, far less hopefully getting a job. But it seems to be the case that when young people uh, sit before human resources and whatever else it is, they themselves have a list of demands. And it is that you employ me, I want this, I want that, and I want the other. And it seems that increasingly they're horrified by this sense of entitlement that it is that they want to start at 75,000 and upwards, it is that they want so many new qualities and so on, and it seems to be something that's increasingly evident. And I think that part of the reason for that is because of the decline of Christian principles and indeed the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways in which I think that this is finding expressed, as I said, is very simple and yet I think it's profound, is with regard to two particular words that certainly I'm sure that all of us here from our earliest days were taught to understand and to know and to use, but two particular words that I think increasingly are not found amongst the people of our day. And it is that these two words are the word please and the word thank you. That it is that I'm saying that these two words, that they should have a priority, an increasing priority, in those who make profession of faith in Jesus Christ. That when it is that we come eh, to God in prayer, our attitude should always be one of the creature coming to the Creator. That it is that we should recognize the vast gulf 
that exists between what we are and who and what it is that, that, that God is. That it is that there should be no sense of entitlement on our part. But it is that this word eh, of eh, asking in terms of please and responding in terms of thanks, but it's a word that should also have a high priority eh, in our walk with God. And particularly this eh, response of thank you. I think probably if the truth be told, we probably use the word eh, please more than it is that we use the word thank you. And that I think itself is a reminder of the effect that the fall has had upon us. Yet if there's anything that should be of more concern to us, it is that we continue to become a people who constantly and increasingly are giving thanks to our God, giving thanks to him uh, for who he is, giving thanks to him for what he has done for us. And that's why it is that I wanted to focus on what it is that Paul writes here particularly in this Thanksgiving weekend. You see, the sad and tragic part of this Thanksgiving weekend is that tomorrow there will be countless thousands who will gather together as family and friends, perhaps having not gathered together since the last Thanksgiving, and it is that the tables will be creaking with food. And by the time that they've consumed the food, no doubt their chairs will be creaking as well. But in terms of the weight that is upon the table, the weight that is upon the chair, the thing that will be saddest most of all is that no thanks whatsoever will be offered to their Creator. No thanks whatsoever will be offered to God for the provision that He's made for their bodily needs, for the fact that He has given them the ability to purchase these things, to taste of the Lord and see that the Lord is good, and it is that they'll sit at the table and get up from the table, and it is that God will not even have been in their thoughts at any moment. But Paul, as he writes here hey, to the Thessalonians, he reminds them what is God's will for his people. And it is that he divides it into a, a triad, we, we could say, basically, basically here. He says, rejoice always. That if you want to know what God's will is for you, then you rejoice. Pray without ceasing. That's another part of God's will for you. It's not as though you need to go seeking for the spot that's marked X, wanting to know what it is that God wants you to do. And then it is that he says in verse 18, giving thanks in all circumstances. And he, he concludes this triad with that phrase, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And he reminds them that this is what should be characterizing them as a people more and more. And Paul very simply and directly says to them, in everything, give thanks. No exceptions, no excuses. Nothing is outside the parameters of what it is that the Word itself he, he, he speaks of. But with everything in life, with everything you experience, with everything that would seem positive, as well as that which seems negative, give thanks no matter what it might be, except without the obvious exceptions of your own personal sins. Paul is simply through the Spirit saying to us, no matter what happens to you in life, good or bad, positive or negative, be thankful. No matter your lot, no matter what circumstances, no matter what struggle, no matter what vicissitudes, no matter what struggle, trial, testing, it is that God's will for us, if we are in Christ, is that we give thanks and constantly give thanks. And it is that we are to find reason and look for reason and know the reasons why it is that God calls us to this attitude and to this place. Now it is that I think we need to remember, particularly in this unthankful age that we live in, is that thanksgiving in many ways is the essence of Christian living and attitude. Thanksgiving is the essence of Christian living and attitude. Why is it that I say this? Because I think the Bible clearly teaches that being unthankful, being forgetful of what it is that God has done for you, that it's the very essence of the unregenerate heart, of the person who has known nothing of God's grace toward them in Christ and who is still dead in their trespasses and sins. Think of what it is that Paul says in Romans chapter 1. What it is that he does there is that he identifies the ungodly with some very direct and hard-hitting words. Listen to what he says in verse 21. The new God, that is through the conscience and the creation, God was visibly manifest to them, he was experientially manifest to them, 
But even though they knew God through the creation and conscience, this is what he then goes on to say, listen, they did not honor him as God or what? Or give him thanks. That's the indictment on unregenerate men and women. That's the indictment on the non-Christian of our day. The unchristian man, woman, boy or girl refuses to do what is basic, and that is to thank God for everything, to come near their Creator and acknowledge Him that He is God and that it is that He bestows all good things upon them. Then we forget the God who created all things, the God who gives them life and, and breath, the God in whom it is that they live and move and have their being, the God who reveals Himself in terms of conscience and the heart in terms of His Word and so on, the God who gives every good and perfect gift that he is the one and the only one to whom it is that all thanks are to be rendered and at all times. But it is the law, it is the characteristic of the unregenerate person, the unsafe person, that they will not give God thanks. Now, the unregenerate person may, like a parrot, without meaning, witlessly, parrot phrases like, thank God for that. But it may be that in terms of some quasi-religious activity that they offer what they consider to be a prayer of thanks to the God that they don't know. And they think that they're okay with that. So the question I want to ask and try and answer at this point is, what characterizes those who never give God thanks? What characterizes them? Well, the first thing I think is this, that there are those people who go through life thinking that things happen as a result of luck. They think that things happen as a result of luck. They think it's a fortuitous course of events over which nothing has control and it just happens to happen that way. And if it doesn't happen for them the way that it ought to happen for them, they become bitter, they become complaining, and life takes on a sour kind of meaning. And even though it is that they may try to manipulate what they consider to be the lucky factors of life, they are unsuccessful, and so it is that they have no thankfulness at, at all. Who is to thank when it is that that's your mindset? You can't thank luck, because luck doesn't even have control over itself. And so therefore there's no thanks in their hearts. I think this was brought home very clearly to me a Friday evening. I was in get, getting gas, and of course I went in at the wrong time because it is that there was a queue in front of me that really weren't wanting gas, but they were wanting the lottery tickets that were available at the gas station. There was this gentleman in front of me, and I nearly collapsed when it was that I heard how, how many lottery tickets he'd bought and the cost. And the chap said to him, that'll be $85. <laughs> and there he was, with $85 worth of lottery tickets. And when I went out, he'd got into his car, and he's rubbing things and doing things, and you could see his face getting longer and longer and longer. I thought, poor soul. Poor soul. Thinking that a lottery ticket is really what will do him good. Thinking that he's got a chance of winning the lottery. I heard some mathematics professors say that in terms of law of 649 and so on, there's more chance of you and I flying under our own power than there is in winning the lottery. And yet it is how many folk today in the waking up and they're looking to luck as they consider it. But they don't give thanks to God. What about the second type of person, those who are fatalists in the world? They don't necessarily think that luck is in charge, but they think that there's some mental force out there. There's some certain inevitability that's preset by the stars or some other aberration in their own thinking, and somehow it's all forced down upon them and upon a track that they're led all along, and then fatalistically, they reluctantly accept what is utterly inevitable and unchangeable as far as they're concerned. And that's the way that it's going to be. It's, it's their destiny, and it is that they will not argue with what's to be their destiny. So who are there for us to thank in terms of whatever good comes out of that circumstance? No one to thank. For him is force. It's an unidentifiable movement. There is no personhood. And so it is that there's no one to thank for anything, good or bad. What a tragic state is theirs. 
Then thirdly, there's those who believe that somehow they can control life. We've all heard the phrase they're a control freak. But it is that some people are control freaks, not only to their own detriment, but to the detriment of their spouses or families and whoever else it may be. But very often one of the things that characterizes the, the control freak is that they're positive thinkers. That they're usually successful people who, having been successful, are not really sure why it is that they've been successful, they then begin to attribute that success to their own skill about everything good that happens to them. To them. As far as they're concerned, they've done it, they've arranged it, they've orchestrated it, they've dreamed it, they've schemed it, they've planned it, they've made it happen, they've pulled it off. And all the credit goes to them and none to God. And even within the church, there is this deceptive and yet subtle form of teaching that seems to be increasing in our day and age. Have you ever watched or listened to Joel Osteen? Now his church. I mean, we would fit in a little corner of it. His church is tens of thousands. When the camera pulls out and looks around the stadium, I think it's the biggest church in North America in terms of those who attend. And then it is that uh, Joel comes out. Have you ever seen him? He's a good looking guy. He's got a beautiful head of hair. He's got a, a, a sort of a perfect presentation physically. He's got a beautiful suit. And he's got the gift of the gap. There's no doubt about it. He's got that smile and the teeth just sparkle. But basically what Joel is, is presenting is the power of positive thinking. That it is what we can do, what we can control, what we can manipulate, that that's all that we need. But then the next step is that all credit goes to the individual and none to God. Why? Because what did God have to do with anything in our lives? And so the world is made up, I think, in terms of the unregenerate, of these kinds of thankless people. The person who basically lives in accordance with luck. The fatalist. The control freak. And you find this character, I would say, in those the unregenerate that, that come across our path. They don't thank God. What's the result then in our lives? And there is a definite result. I think we see this in society today. Ingratitude, non-thankfulness. It shrivels hearts. It shrivels hearts. It distorts perception and it perverts understanding. It does not promote that attitude that Paul speaks of when he says, consider one another more highly than you do yourselves. It does not promote what it is that Paul is saying here, give thanks in all circumstances. An ingratitude, if it's anything, I think is a sign of childishness. You know what it's like, perhaps, when your children were little. And it is that they said, I want, I want, I want. And it is that eventually, as they wore you down, you gave them what it is that they wanted, and you were hoping that they would say, thank you, Mom, thank you, Dad. And yet it is that they grabbed it out of your hand and they walked away. You need to stop them and to say, you've got to say thank you. But it is that ingratitude, therefore, is a sign of childishness. And I think also it's a sign of something far worse than childishness. It's a sign of grave spiritual sickness. You go back to what Paul says in Romans 1, and it is that Paul very clearly is saying to us that the unregenerate man is sick. Now this being the case, you would think it would be something, this spirit of ingratitude that's not found in the life of Christians. And yet even Christians can be unthankful. What I'm saying is for a Christian to be unthankful is abnormal. There's something wrong. You see, being unthankful cuts across the grain of the new life, the new creation in Christ, the new I, the new you. And because of the fall, it is that we ourselves when the New Testament repeatedly calls for thankfulness, that we can be tempted to be ungrateful to God. Think of the overarching principle that Scripture gives us in Romans 8 and 28, and how often it is that we spout these words, and yet how often is it that we really live them out? Romans 8 and, 8, 8, 8 and 28. We know, Paul's saying, that's your experience. 
that's your, your, your knowledge. We know that all things, whether good, whether bad, whether indifferent, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Do you believe it? Do I? Do you live it out? More and more increasingly I come across Christian believers and what characterizes them is a spirit of unbelief. As a characteristic when it is that they don't take God and his word in Romans 8, 28 and, and say, not just from head knowledge, but from conviction and experience, I know that all things, whatever they be, are working together for good because it is that I love God and I know that God is working in all these things for his glory and my good and, and indeed for his purpose. And you see, that's the overarching umbrella that should cover every Christian here, here today and in terms of life. That no matter what happens, what has happened or what will happen in the days to come, it basically all falls under the umbrella of Romans 8.28 and it will be by God working together all things for our good. The thing may not in itself be good, but God takes the bad thing and turns it to a good purpose for our good and for our eternal glory. Think of it. I can be thankful for the pain that I go through in surgery if I know that healing is going to come through that surgery. I can be thankful for the difficulty I go through in preparation if I know that the product of that preparation is going to change lives. I can be thankful for the process of pain and the experience of pain that's inflicted in my body if I know that in the end I'm going to be healthier because I exercise and I exercise increasingly. And you take those principles and apply them to your life and there are many things that involve that. And as long as you have that long-term perspective, as long as you have that end result before you, you can be thankful for the process that's less than happy and less than joyful. Because when it is that you're given that perception where you can see what God is doing, that he's blending everything in our lives for his good and glory and for our good, then in everything we can give thanks. How many times do we perhaps just take a moment in the week, and particularly when it is, let's say, it's been a bad week for us, for whatever reason, and it is that we're beginning to doubt what God says in Romans 8 and verse 28, Whatever at that moment, and I think this is something that, that we should do, and I know Paul says, says in Philippians, forgetting what is behind. But sometimes it's good to look back over God's dealings with you. And to see those moments, particularly the difficult moments, whether it be physically, whether it be mentally, whether it be in terms of family circumstances, marriage problems, whatever it may be, and to see how it is that up until that very moment, that you're, the way you're feeling now, that God has brought all these things, difficult and negative as they were. And you can say like Samuel of old, well hitherto is the Lord who has helped me. And I know that on the basis of what the Lord has done for me in the past, then no matter how negative I think things are today, I can look forward to the future with God's help and in God's strength that even that which seems bad and negative will be for my good. You see, the early church was characterized by what? Thanksgiving. The psalmist, what's the psalmist characterized by? Thanksgiving. And this has got to be the most thankless age that there has ever been. It really is. On the one hand, you get people who have more than they've ever had, and who know that there's more yet that they don't have, and no matter what they have, they don't have everything they could have, and so because they don't have everything that they want, it breeds a terrible kind of thanklessness. And we see that more and more and more. So what it is that Paul says here, give thanks in all circumstances. Paul is saying to us, this is what characterizes the spirit-filled believer. 
the normal believer, the thankful believer, the joyful believer, the praying believer. If it is that you're asking to be filled with the Spirit, then the, one of the evidences that you're filled with the Spirit is that you're giving thanks and everything. That it'll be gushing out of you like a fountain, like a well. Giving him thanks for salvation. Giving him thanks for all that he provides for us in terms of the necessities of life. Even in times of great fear and anxiety and worry and stress, being thankful. Listen to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him, established in your faith, just as you were instructed, and overflowing with gratitude. See, the interview of Paul is bringing this profound spiritual experience that has been theirs. And he says that the evidence of this is that you overflow with gratitude. That's to be what it is that, that, that we are. What to be said of every Christian? Wow, they're a thankful person. What a thankful person he, he, he they are. Every time that man, that woman, that boy or girl opens their mouths, out comes thanksgiving, out comes gratitude to God, it's overflowing in their lives. Listen to Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. There you get the application of the gospel and all that characterizes the gospel. And look at how Paul ends this verse. And be thankful. If it is that you've known of the profound mystery of salvation and all that it speaks of, the evidence is that you will be thankful. Verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks in everything. Verse 2 of chapter 4, this is what he says. Devote your life to it. Devote your life to praying with an attitude of thanksgiving. It's like a, a, a repeated phrase, a refrain that's running through the scripture to remind us of the danger that we can become ungrateful, but the need that if it is that our faith is real, then we will be constantly giving, giving thanks to, to, to our God. <coughs> so I think the question that we need to ask ourselves today is this. Do I rejoice always? Do I pray without ceasing? But am I increasingly thankful? Thankful to God, not just for the good things. I mean, it's easy. I know some of you say, well, you're standing up there, Alan. You don't know what I'm going through or what I'm experiencing and how difficult life is for me. I know that. And I know that, as you well know, that when things are going good in your life, it's easy to give God thanks then. Thank you, Lord. It's so easy to come to the place of prayer. But when it is that things seem to be going from bad to worse for you or for a loved one, but it is that the circumstances and the outworking of God's providence in your life seem so dark and heavy, sometimes it's difficult to even groan in terms of giving a word of thanks. And yet, we're told, give thanks in everything. If we're controlled by the Spirit, these things will fall into place. And that's the way it's to be. Let me conclude. I'll just give you seed thoughts because I've got half the sermon still left here. And the time's gone. What is it that corrupts the inner springs? What is it that stops us giving thanks to God as we should, whether good or bad times? First thing about here is doubt. Doubt stops thanksgiving. We doubt the character of God. We doubt the goodness of God. You're not sure that God's word can be trusted. You're not sure that our God is the God of sovereign power. It is that you doubt his wisdom. If God were really wise, then he would do things differently in my life. No, friend. God is wise. He himself is wisdom. And it is that he does all things that are wise and good for his glory and, and your good. So doubt causes non-thanksgiving. Second thing is selfishness. That really poisons the, the springs of, of gratitude. 
That's the attitude that says to God, look, I don't want it the way it is. I want it the way that I want it. And I'm not content with the way it is that God is working this thing out in my life. In other words, I'm saying to you, God, it's my way or it's the highway. And that's selfishness. And that selfishness basically says, God, get off the throne. For it is that I want to sit on the throne. I want to be in charge. I want to run my life. I want to call the shots. And it is that thanksgiving disappears. Worldliness. It stops us giving thanks. Someone whose vision is filled with, with trivial things, with pleasure, with prominence, with popularity, with prestige, with people, with places, possessions, pursuits. Somebody who's a, a gaze is filled up with the trivia of this world, the stuff that's passing away. They're so consumed with all this stuff, they're not going to be thankful. How many of us this week we saw, as it were, just the, oh, just the total stupidness in a sense of what happened to Kim Kardashian? And it is that she's been showing off all this jewelry and so on. And then it is that some guys tied her up, stole the jewellery and so on. And when it is that you, you read about this family, if they don't repent, I hate to think what it's going to be like when they stand before the judgment seat of God. Because it is that they're continually flaunting material things and doing everything that the world would want to do. But as far as I know, they're not giving thanks to God so caught up with the things of this life that it stops them giving, giving thanks. Another thing that stops thankfulness is a critical spirit. That seems thankfulness if it is that you're constantly a person of a critical spirit. A person of a critical spirit is one who's bitter, who's negative, who has a sour life attitude. And it's something that can be produced by any number of things but if it runs unchecked in your life, it destroys a thankful heart. Blinds your, your vision. It warps your understanding. It makes you useless to God and you become a proverbial pain in the neck to everybody else. Because it is that you're always of a critical spirit. And a critical spirit makes you a bitter, negative, thankless person. And where does it rise from? It rises from pride. It rises from the enlarged ego that says, I deserve better than this. I'm worthy of more than this. Or I've been hurt, I've been wounded by somebody. And I'm just going to take the pain and I'm going to run it through the course of the rest of my life. And that critical spirit destroys thankfulness. The next thing, really finish, impatience. Some people don't give thanks because they're discont discontent over the perception that God doesn't move in accordance with their pay timer. God doesn't operate in their schedule. God isn't working by their clock. And they just can't take that process. They can't come to the point where they say, thank you, Lord, I can see your hand at work. The process is slow, slower than I would like it, but I thank you for it, and I praise you for it. But they're like the child with the tantrum. God, I want it, and I want it now. And again, is that not what characterizes our society increasingly? Instant self-gratification. No patience with the world or with anybody else. They want everything in their world fixed and fixed immediately. Impatience will destroy thankfulness. Learn to thank God for the process. Learn to thank Him for the timing that there is His. Then sixthly, what will destroy thankfulness is coldness, spiritual coldness. Think of the lukewarm heart of the Laodiceans. Or think about the Ephesian church in Revelation that had left its first love. There's a lack of zeal for Christian service, a lack of zeal concerning the love of Christ. There's a neglect of the Bible, the neglect of prayer. There's a waste of time in the trivia of life. And you end up running an empty. 
He becomes spiritually indifferent, lethargic, and apathetic. And in many ways, even the church that holds four square to the gospel, you know and I know when you speak to other Christians, there is a sort of spiritual apathy that seems to abound even amongst whom we consider the very best. Then lastly, rebellion. Downright, outright, flat rebellion. It's the person who says, I'm not thankful because I'm angry with God. I'm not thankful because I don't like what he's doing in my life. I'm, I'm, I'm mad. And I'm unthankful. And I know that I'm unthankful. And I'm going to stay unthankful. Just plain rebellious. It's amazing. Their lot, is, their lot in life isn't what it is that they'd hoped for. And because of that, they're flat out unthankful. And they defy the command of God and the commandments of God in every sense. See, all of us today, we need to be continually thankful to God for the unspeakable gift of his love toward us in his son, Jesus Christ. We ought to be increasingly thankful to God for the fact that no matter how many times we've sinned this past week, even already this last day morning, no matter how heinous, no matter how gross the sin that perhaps we have committed, it is that we are still able, because of God's love for us in Christ, to know forgiveness and the application of his atoning work to our souls. To be thankful. For the fact that this Lord's Day, that every Lord's Day is a constant reminder of the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that he has conquered sin and salvation can be ours in Christ. I think I've told you before, but in the culture that I was brought up in as a young boy and then as a teenager, it is that I could hate a Sunday. On a Saturday night, all I longed for was Monday morning. Because Sunday was the day that was just, oh no, too heavy, too difficult, not joyful. And then as I became a Christian, I began to see that even for the perhaps the right reasons that things were done and said in a certain way, one of the things that I had never been taught was that the Lord's Day was to be a day of rejoicing. The Lord's Day was a day of thanksgiving. The Lord's Day was a day of standing up and shouting, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! So this Thanksgiving weekend, this Lord's Day, <coughs> let it be our prayer that as a congregation, and as the individuals that make up this congregation, that increasingly, we would be a people of thanksgiving in whatever circumstances, knowing that this is God's will for us in Christ. Amen. Let's stand to pray.